graphs. Thank you very much. Uh, this talk is also uh, going to present some stuff which is yet to be published. Uh, uh, specifically, these are, it, it's one of the projects that I was working on in the previous year here in the IS. Uh, so I'm talking about generic eigenvalues and eigenfunctions on metric graphs. And the motto for talking about generic, uh, generic genericity result is that, yeah, okay, so let me start. So I'm going to talk about metric graphs. So by metric graph, I mean uh, one dimensional manifold with singularity, that's the important thing. So we have a bunch of one dimensional segments and we glue them, uh, the colors, Indicate the gluing according to a certain graph uh, structure. Uh, the metric on each one of the edges is going to be flat. So essentially, the metric is, uh, is described by the edge length. So that's a bunch of uh, positive numbers. And I will just write gamma, comma, L, that gamma would be the graph, L would be the metric. And by a pair of eigenvalue and eigenfunction, k eigenvalue, f eigenfunction of gamma L, I mean a solution to the ODE on each one of the edges, that's just minus the second derivative, the Laplacian equal to k square f. And a ver the vertex condition, that's the analog of boundary conditions. And in this case, I will talk about the Neumann vertex conditions. So it means that when I'm gluing the function at a certain vertex, I want all of the functions from all of the edges to agree on the value. This would be continuity. And the sum of their derivatives, the incoming derivatives, vanish. So this gives me a well-posed uh, problem. And now let me go back and talk about uh, genericity uh, in a broader sense. And the, the best example for genericity is the result of uh, Karen Ullerbeck that is here with us. Uh, so assume that M is a compact manifold uh, for a residual set of uh, smooth metrics. So we consider all possible smooth metrics on M and a residual mean a countable, uh, a countable intersection of uh, open dense sets. Uh, so I have a residual set of good smooth metrics. What do I mean by good? I mean that if G is good, MG, satisfy the following. So each one of its pairs of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions satisfy that the eigenvalue is simple. It's not a multiple eigenvalue. The function is small. So this means that whenever I have a critical point, the gradient function, the gradient vanish, the determinant of the Hessian doesn't vanish. And I don't want zero to be a critical value. So this means that that uh, whenever f vanish, gradient f doesn't vanish. And this was actually very important to, to even start talking about families of eigenfunctions and things like that. It was a very seminal work and later on generalized in many, many other, uh, to many other operators. And the, the nice thing that I like about this uh, specific one is uh, that uh, the genericity is attained not by using perturbing the bad situation every time out, but actually by considering the large space, uh, let's call it space of solutions of all those triplets of a pair of mg, so that's like lambda fg, and analyzing the critical points of this space when we project it onto different. Uh, uh, when you project it. So the main tools that were used in this were the Smale-Sarge uh, theorem and proving some transversality results, and then showing that whenever you have a bunch of bad points, you project, you see to which uh, metrics they belong, and, you, and the, the set of all of these bad matrix is a very small set. The problem is that this proof does not extend to metric graphs, uh, mainly because we're not talking about the manifold. And in particular, we don't have unique continuation, which is where everything fails. So let me give you some bad examples. So the first kind of trivial example is that if you just took the, the circle, uh, and rather than the zero trivial uh, eigenvalue, all other eigenvalues have multiplicity two. Uh, so all other eigenvalues are of this form. 
and they have a two-dimensional space, this the A and B uh, of, eigen, of eigenfunctions. Now, a more complicated example is take any graph that has a loop, has one edge that connects a vertex to itself. In such case, I will get infinitely many eigenfunctions that are supported on that loop. So it's just the sine function on that loop where it vanishes on the vertex and the two derivatives cancel each other. So it can be extended to be zero on the rest of the graph. And it means that any, any other interior point, any point which is not, not lie on the loop uh, would be a point where both the, the function would vanish and all of its derivatives. So it's not a most, zero is a critical value and it happens infinitely often. Another bad example, which does not directly relate to Uhlenbeck, but to things that I'm going to talk about next, is that essentially what we expect if we have a, a complete uh, system, we, we put some uh, vertex conditions and we expect that if we add any other vertex conditions, we won't get solutions. But there are certain situations where you can add other vertex conditions and still get infinitely many solutions. One of those, or I want to claim the only one, uh, is if we have only two vertices, all edges between them, we call it a Mandarin graph. In such case, we have a certain symmetry, which is if you, you can just simply reflect all edges simultaneously around their middle. And this symmetry means that all eigenfunction, this, it's a symmetry that in, is independent of what kind of metric I put. And all eigenfunctions and all, all eigenfunctions can be chosen to be symmetric or anti-symmetric. And for example, roughly half of the eigenfunctions would satisfy that f at this point and f at this point are equal, which is not in my vertex conditions. Uh, so this is another bad example. All of these can be treated uh, by modding out certain symmetries, but I'm going to neglect it for now because it, it's technical. And I'm, I will assume from now on that uh, I'm talking about the graph that has E edges. It is finite connected, has no degree to vertices because that's a removal of singularity. And I don't want to have loops and I don't want to look at the mandarin. So from now on, I'm not going to repeat it. This, this is assumption for everything. So the first result I'm going to talk about uh, is K being a simple eigenvalue and F being Morse and zero not a critical value which is in the one dimensional case, it's equivalent to say that F doesn't vanish entirely on, it, on any edge because it's simply an ODE. Uh, so the theorem is that first of all, we have an open dense that's much stronger than residual. We have an open dense set of good matrix G uh, such that if we're, if we're talking the graph with a good matrix, all pairs satisfy one and two. Now, the second thing, which is kind of interesting, is that we have also an arithmetic, uh, an arithmetic kind of uh, uh, statement, which is not here the, the open then set of good matrix is implicit. Here it's very explicit. I'm telling you, give me any Q independent, rationally independent L. This means just the, the edge lengths are independent over the rationals, something very arithmetic. Give me such an L, let K, KFN. K and Fn be the pairs of gamma n, then there is a density one sequence. It's this one is stronger, this one is weaker. A density one subsequence for, that satisfies uh, one and two. Uh, this is generalization of a result by Friedlander on the that showed that proved residual uh, for the simplicity and Berkeley and Liu that kind of proved uh, property two for residual case, and it's a generalization of all of them, but it's proven independently. Now I want to talk about the, the vertex conditions because that was the problem that really captured my mind for a while because it's such, it seems so trivial, like I'm adding another vertex condition. You see open dance, did you also have full measure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. open dance, full measure, it's, it's more than that. It's like the, the complement is a positive co-dimension uh, algebraic variety. Um, so now, okay, what I mean by vertex conditions. 
So I'm going to talk about scaling variant product conditions. So take the vector of all the values of the function of vertices and the normal derivatives and normalize them just by one over k. So it's scale invariant. Uh, so my vertex conditions were some kind of a linear, the Neumann vertex conditions that I showed you were some kind of a linear uh, relation on these guys. So it means that all of those traces, I call them, lie in some kind of a linear, linear space. Now I'm saying, if I'm giving some homogeneous polynomial, homogeneous because everything here is projectively, these are eigenfunctions, so if you give me any homogeneous polynomial that doesn't vanish on one trace, one trace for some k, f, and l with k simple, I would call it a non-trivial vertex condition because it, it means that it, it doesn't come, it, it doesn't uh, come from the Neumann vertex condition. And the theorem would be that for any gamma and non-trivial vertex condition, I have an open then set of good uh, of good uh, matrix matrix uh, such that Q doesn't vanish on all of the traces of all of the pairs of gamma L. And again, the same thing if I'm, if I'm now talking about rational independent Ls, then I can say that in density one, for density one subsequence, Q doesn't vanish. Uh, this is also, kind of a generalization of a much, much simpler thing where Berkolaito and Liu show, showed that the values of the function on the, on the vertices doesn't vanish generically. And this gives you like every, every, every vertex condition that you can think of. Uh, one thing that follows from it is that you have no common eigenvalues. So say that you start with the same set of intervals and you glue them in different ways, uh, so you get two graphs of E edges and you assign them the same L, then for an open dense set, the spectrum, the, the spectra uh, are disjoint or you have only intersection only at the trivial eigenvalue. And if L is Q independent, then the common spectra uh, has density zero in the spectrum of each one of these graphs. Uh, okay, I don't have much time, so... I won't get into the details. I'll just say that the main feature behind this thing is that the solution space of the triplets has a nice finite dimensional compact moduli space. So if I take X and I mod out scaling and I mod out something which I call wavelength extension, that's this nice picture. I won't explain what it is. Uh, then I, I get a parameterization of this space uh, which is uh, almost an algebraic variety. It is uh, it is compact. It is compact and finite dimensional. It's very nice. And if I further project it only onto the torus, so it is in the torus and r to the four e. And if I look just at the projection of that into the torus, I get something which is uh, up to exponentiating it. Uh, is just an algebra algebraic variety uh, that intersect the torus. And recently, Sarnak and Kurasov show that uh, it is actually an irreducible uh, variety, which is the main thing that I'm using here. Uh, so some pictures, some pictures. Uh, the, the general method of the proof, uh, again, I don't have enough time, so uh, the general method of the proof would be to show that given a property that I want to show that generically doesn't happen, I can find some kind of a set uh, that controls this property. So it means that whenever I have a triple that satisfies the, this property, this bad property, the relevant point in sigma lies in A. And then only I, and I need to show that A is nice and that the dimension of A is smaller than the dimension of sigma. And this would give me that I generically doesn't hit A. So for example, if P was K being not simple, then A would be the singular set, uh, the singular points of sigma. Uh, so I'll just finish up with some future questions. So the first thing is that, is there a nice resolution of singularities to sigma and Y? Uh, such a resolution of singularities can tell us a lot about 
uh, the evolution of eigenfunctions when we change the graph. Uh, another thing is I'm talking about the generic case, but what happened in the non-generic case? So what is the weakest condition on L such that gamma L has infinite sequence of more eigenfunctions, say? So that's actually something that uh, was recently conjectured that it relates to Pliel estimates uh, on nodal count for quantum graphs. Uh, the third thing I want to talk about, which is a very arithmetic in nature problem, uh, Samak and Kurosov show that whenever L is rationally independent, the dimension of the spectrum over the rational is infinite. Now, we actually believe that something much stronger happens, and we believe that generically, it's not only that the dimension is infinite, but actually the spectrum is, is independent over the rationals. And it's a very, very hard statement to prove. And right now, we're trying to work on the simplest case that we can uh, find, hopefully, to have it, be able to say something about it. So thank you very much. That may be kind of a question from a bit of a different side, but I always wondered whether there is some interesting way to make sense of uh, the notion of monodromy of the eigenvalues so that you can perturb metrics and your eigenfunctions get. That's exactly what, what, what here when I'm talking about the nice resolution of singularities, that's exactly where I'm where I'm aiming for to be able to talk about this. Because you need to track them down, and once you hit a singularity, you're in a problem. So you want to say what happens when you go around the singularity. I have a couple of questions. So I guess the point is that you want to use star scale theorem. No, you don't. That's that's, uh, that's exactly where where everything starts because they cannot use star scale theorem in this case. So this is why you get a nicer condition than the one that starts new. No, I get a nicer condition because it's essentially one dimensional, and everything happens on the vertex conditions. So essentially, the problem on the edges is very simple. It's just the ODE, but it becomes complicated <laughs> once you once you start like manipulating the edges, connecting them in, in weird ways. And then it becomes like a very algebraic kind of question where you're just now going to work about, to talk about the space of these vertex conditions. And, 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 and so, yeah. So, but you still need to show, I mean, when you say you need to show this that it's nice, I, I would think in the side snail con uh, context, you would need to show that you have some manifold. No, 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 no. So everything is finite dimensional. It's very, the, the, the thing is that now in this picture, I have my manifold that sits inside the toes and I have a flow, a linear flow in the direction of L. So now L is just the direction of the linear flow. And say that I have a certain set, which is bad. So I want to say, first of all, that when I change my L, I'm looking at the L's for which, the, the, for which I'm going to hit this bad set. So if this bad set say, said, which what I usually want to refer to is to have it like some kind of a variety, algebraic variety of, of positive co-dimension, then I, I can say something about the set of L's that hit it. Now, the other thing is that when these L's are rationally independent, it's going to cover the toes density. And then if the set is very small, the, if, whenever I get a nice enough set, in this case, I need a set that the, the measure of its boundary is zero, a Jordan set. Whenever I, I get a, a set, who, which is a Jordan set, the proportion of heating times inside this set, so if I want to say how much, how many of my, how many of my points are going to lie inside the set out of the infinitely many points that I have is going to be proportional to the measure of that set. So if that set is going to be very small, it's going to be zero. And that's, that's exactly why I, can, why I can say that the density one subsequence would, would not hit this set. So I, I kind of get 
all of the genericity by simply showing that I have a property that I can represent here as a bad set. And that's kind of like exactly opposite of what everything usually do in genericity in these situations where they don't look at the broad picture, but they try to resolve, to perturb away from each bad situation. Thank you for the question. Okay, let's thank Leo again.